How many of you use Baroque stuff? Okay, so we have a few. One over there, a guy, not a mom. From, Cal from, from Calgary. Calgary, we talked. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, and he sold his entire house. He sold everything. Yeah, entire house. It came over here, and I guess some of you were surprised that it wasn't a mom. But it was the moms who bought at the, <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> at the end of the day. So obviously, you've had a lot of success. You've got crazy growth. But I always like to take things back a little bit before we get into that to say, let's talk about your past a little bit. Um, you're from Montreal, so that's, I know that. I am. Born and raised in the West Island of Montreal. Um, I went to McGill University to study to be a teacher, and I was a teacher for 10 years. Um, and then I became pregnant, came up with this whole gig, and, and here we are today. So that's a little bit about my background. So how did that idea come about? I mean, you're at home, you're pregnant. Yeah, so actually I was, um, I was working at an inner city school at the time, and so I was on a preventative mat leave. The, the hallways were a little dangerous. It was a, it was a tough school, and so my doctor said, you need to be off. So I went home, and I started to look around my house and, say, and thought to myself, I need to get rid of my stuff and, and make room for the baby. So I started to declutter, and I, I started off with some you know, um, traditional classified websites, which felt really creepy to me. Uh, and then I discovered some mom groups on social media, and I thought, well, this is really great, feels a lot more safe, feels more like a trusted environment, but the experience was very clunky, very disorganized, and so I turned to Carl, my co-founder and husband, and I said, hey, you know, can we build something better? He happens to be um, a developer as well as an entrepreneur. Um, so convenient. And I, yeah, and I, <laughs> I really just wanted to build it for myself and for our community, and, and well, this is, this is where it brought us today. That's awesome. That's, that's awesome. That's the story. So were your parents entrepreneurs, or how did, how did this? Well, um, my mom was a teacher, yeah. and my dad actually uh, is and was an entrepreneur. He's semi-retired now and actually drives U uh, an Uber car for fun. Awesome. Good for him. <laughs> but um, yeah, he had a paint store in the Plateau of, of Montreal. It's 118 years old. It's actually a family business, so it was started by my great-grandfather. Very cool. Yeah. And was it, was it a tough decision for you to make that jump? I mean, obviously you saw a need. You had a career prior. I mean, I have I have all the respect in the world for teachers because I don't know how, how teachers do what they do. I have no idea. They shape our kids. I've got two kids. One is over there laying on a beanbag. But it's a lot. It's a lot. So I have a lot of respect for that. But making that decision, was that an easy one for you? It wasn't so much a decision that I had to make because I never, I never really felt like I left doing what I love doing. So I never pictured leaving teaching. I wasn't trying to leave teaching. Um, we started Garage Sale, it really took off, and then it was kind of like, do I, do I go back or do I continue on this? And then I thought, it's all kind of similar. I'm building communities all over the world instead of building communities within the classroom and the local school districts. I'm just doing it at like a much larger scale. No, I'm not teaching kids, but I am building communities. And part of why I became a teacher was to, to build communities. That was, that's why I chose the school that I worked in. So I, I feel like I'm still doing um, just as rewarding, if not more of a reward, rewarding job today, being able to scale that. That's, that's amazing, to be able to take what you know and turn it into something so incredible. What is your reach now? Uh, where, where is Barrage now? So we are all over the USA, we're in every state, and we're actually in like many communities in each of every state. Wow. Uh, we're in every Canadian province, we're overseas, so we're in Japan, we're in Italy, so Europe, Asia. Um, we have just about 2,000 garage sale communities right now. That's amazing, and you're growing? And we're growing. That's, that's awesome. So what, what, what is the next target for you when you're talking about growth? Where are you trying to go? So now we're, we're still working on the United States and going even deeper into the, to, to like be at the heart of every local community. The way Branch Cell works is, is that it's super hyper local. So we just want to be in an area that every mom is familiar with. Um, and we'll do the same in Canada. And my understanding and is that you're really trying to create that neighborhood feel when, when you're expanding out and that's why you want to be that hyper focused. Yeah, exactly, that community feel. Um, also, you know, there's local administrators, so somebody's always watching, um, and, and it, it just feels like a trusted environment when there's somebody watching, as well as being very hyper-local. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you stay on top of all of that? You're everywhere. How do, how do we stay on top of being everywhere? Yeah, how, do you, like, how are you organized internally, I guess, is what I'm asking. Like, I can't, 
So we have, um, we have a, a large member support team, um, and we have uh, community managers, and we just, we just built a system that scale, that's scalable and works, actually. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah. I'm a marketer, so I have another question for you. Um, are, how are you marketing? Like, are you, are you, are you community focused? Is there, is there a larger uh, emphasis, or how, how are you? So in terms of marketing, we're working on a lot of product-led growth marketing right now. Yeah. So we're doing a lot of um, contests and, and uh, that sort of thing. We're also boots on the ground. When we launch in, in new communities, often I'm there. That kind of thing. So, yeah. What are some of the challenges? So when you're going into a new community, what are some of the challenges that you have to overcome? Well, you know, um, I think the, the local part is a little bit challenging, but what's nice is that we have admins that are volunteer admins that are uh, local to that area. So we're able to pick their brains a little bit and learn from them. So that makes it a lot easier. Yeah, that, that's really good. So if we take it back a little bit, so as you were growing, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I assume you still are, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced and how did you overcome them? On, on more of like a personal level or? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm here, I want to humanize you a little bit. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's humanize me. Let's, yeah. let's be very transparent. Let's not be the So you take, this, you take this kindergarten teacher, and you pull her out of the classroom, and you throw her into this like growing company, yeah. and there is a lot of intimidating factors to that, I'll be honest. I was, I was really nervous at first. So, you know, we partnered with Sequoia Capital. That's no small feat. And so for me, I'm going like, I have to attend board meetings, I have to talk to these people, and, and, and sound like I know what I'm talking about. And it turns out that I did know what I was talking about because what I've learned over the years is that investors want to deal with founders who are creating a product that solves a problem. And that's exactly what I did. And so it turns out that the chief mom here knows a whole lot about this product and what's needed, and they see a lot of value in that. And it took me time to realize my strength. So at first that part was um, intimidating. I'd say another challenge was this team started as two. So it was my husband and I at a kitchen table. And then we were at a U-Haul one-man office. And then we were 10. And then, and then we were four. And, then, and now we're in this big office and it's like, so what, what are my skills as a leader and as, as a manager? You know, I've only managed, I, I taught kindergarten. So, so I really had to look inside myself and find my strengths again and say, you know what, um, managing a classroom or managing an office isn't all that different. So there's an age difference, but it turns out that students, adults, everybody learns differently, everybody's motivated differently, and you need to empower your students, you need to empower your staff, and that's how you get the best out of your people. So I think the key for me was building up my, my confidence and finding my strengths and applying them to my new position. That's great. It's so inspiring what you've done, what you've done here, where you're headed. I think I think a lot of people here would agree that you, here's a success story in our backyard, which is so amazing to me. I love it. I love it. Um, talking about Sequoia for a minute. I mean, money is a big thing, right? I mean, we all have our dreams. We're trying to follow. We're trying to create these amazing businesses, but we're trying to make some money. So, what are some tips you can give? I mean. When we're going into these meetings and we've never done it before, and you know, we'd love to hear some of your insights on that. Yeah, so you know, I have to give credit to Carl for for a lot of our funding. Um, our seed round was raised in Montreal, and um, Carl was a pretty well known entrepreneur in Montreal, and so a lot of investors were very interested to see what he was building next. I think he became, he, he got that reputation because he did build a few companies. He had a few under his belt and he had sold them. He had bootstrapped them. He hadn't raised money before. He gave a lot of talks and was part of a lot of um, these types of events, um, networking or friendly events as, as he called them, and, and just really got out there. So I think, I think honestly, like number one, you need to get out there. The other thing is for me, I didn't know anybody. Again, I was a kindergarten teacher, so I knew a bunch of other teachers. Um, but you know, having somebody in your company, whether it's a co-founder or like another staff member, um, go out there with their past experience um, and learning from them, I think was, was key for me. That's great. And then what about, you're starting something new, you're creating something that hasn't existed before. How did you deal with naysayers and what were they saying? Well, the biggest naysayer to start was, was actually my husband, was Carl. 
I asked him to build this for me and he said no. There's no way that I'm gonna build uh, another Craigslist. 99.9% .9 of them fail and I'm not doing it. And I looked at him and I said, no, no, like I don't want you to build another Craigslist. I want you to build something different. I, I want to build something completely other than Craigslist. That's what I'm trying to get away from. Um, not, not to put down Craigslist. It's great for another use case, but not for me. Um, and so he sort of didn't really get it. And I'll tell you a, a, a funny story. Um, being a teacher, I know that everybody learns differently and you need to get through to people in different sort of ways. So just talking to him wasn't working, so I showed him. We used to watch um, marathons of Breaking Bad every night. We were going through all the seasons. And I would just um, go on social media, uh, list my stuff, and make all of my meets during the show. And so he would have to pause the show like five times during, which was really annoying, and he'd be sitting there waiting, hearing the conversations that would happen at my doorstep. And so for those of you who don't know exactly what Barrage Sale is, it's a buy and sell platform where like 85, I'd say our demographic is like 85% women, um, and it's neighbors. And so someone shows up at your door, somebody just like you, you end up having a conversation and a relationship is, is built. So it's, it's social and marketplace. That was what I wasn't really able to get across to him, but by showing him, I got across to him. So he was my biggest naysayer. And, and I'd say, um, dude, I have another example. Yeah, okay. I don't know if I'm talking too much. No, just let me know. This is the Tammy show. Okay, fine. So, I, actually, I don't know if it's a naysayer, but I'm talking a lot about Craigslist and competitors, and we get compared to Craigslist a lot, but we're, we're not the same thing. We're not building the same thing at all. I don't even see us as competing with Craigslist. Craigslist user um, is predominantly male, um, somebody who's like a condo owner who is intent driven, looking for a fridge for his condo or a couch. Barrage Sale is a woman or a mom, somebody you know around my age, who's sitting at, standing at, uh, in line at a grocery store looking at the feed, waiting for the next great purse or the, or the next great like outfit for her kid to pop up in the feed so that she can get in line or try to be first to grab the item. So it's very discovery driven. So I, I don't, there's nothing out there that's like garage sale. There's nothing out there that's like this feed of like impulse shopping for women. And in this trusted environment, there's, there just isn't anything. All the competitors seem to be more competitors to Craigslist. So I'd, I'd say some of the naysayers um, compare us too much to those other companies when that's not really what we're going for. All right, cool. And I know that there's a lot of questions in the group, so I'm just going to do a little speed round because I like to ask a little quick questions. Okay, I'm ready. Nothing scary. And then we'll open it up to everybody else. So, Tammy, are you a morning person or a night owl? Definitely a night owl. Coffee or tea? Both. Awesome. What is the first thing you do when you wake up? Okay, I'm not proud, but I, I check my email on my phone. <laughs> It's okay. I'm not proud. <laughs> I think most of us do. That's the start of life, anyway. Uh, what's on your work desk right now? My phone. Awesome. No, actually, now now it's here. So on my work desk right now would probably be my uh, my notebook. What's your favorite app? Garage Sale. Awesome. True, but true story. I use I use the app every day. <laughs> what is your most prized possession? Can it be a human? Absolutely. So it's definitely myself. Yay. <laughs> And finally, what is your favorite work day time waster? Not that you waste a lot of time, I'm sure. Um, I'd have to say it's Pickle Tuesday. <laughs> what is Pickle Tuesday? <laughs> well, one day, one day I brought, I bought, uh, no, downstairs actually, it started downstairs, they opened like a city market, a grocery store, and there were these pickles in a bag with like a funny picture, and I, I bought them for like the desk that were sitting next to mine just as a joke, and it was a Tuesday, and everybody said, oh, look, it's Pickle Tuesday, and then I just started bringing different kinds of pickles on Tuesday. <laughs> it's, it's a weird thing, but we do it. Love it, love it. All right, thank you for your time, Tammy. Thank you. Okay, we have a question. I'll be the mic runner. I don't have a question. I have a comment. Uh, I feel very unwelcome. I'm, I'm a male user of garage sale. <laughs> I feel singled out. But uh, I, I had a great experience. I, I went on to, to just look for an anniversary gift, and I found a very new piece of jewelry. And I love the whole. I love the whole experience. Oh, thank you. What, what is your name? Eric. Eric. Well, thank you, Eric, for that. And you know, you bring up a, a really good point. You know, when you start a company, I think it's important to find out like 
who your core user base would be. And so it starts off with moms, women. But when I look at our communities that have grown over time, it really has become more of a family kind of thing and more of a community kind of thing. So I think it evolves into that, which is why you had that great experience. So I'm really glad to hear it. Do you have another question from Ron? Hi, my Hi. name's Ron. Hi, Ron. Uh, I'm a blogger, entrepreneur.ca. Uh, I was just wondering, in terms of developing a culture, so it seems like you have, a, it, it, just by your space and the way everyone is uh, from your company that I've had a chance to kind of look at, it seems like everyone's really engaged and committed to the vision. What would you say attributes the most to the, developing that kind of culture in, in, in your space? Yeah, it really is all in the people that you hire, and we are really careful to hire for the right culture fit for this company. So I think some of the first things that we look for when people come in the door is, do they know and care about our story? Have they, have they learned about us, and how do they feel about it? Um, everybody that I interview, I ask them if they know our story, and, I've asked, and I ask them how they feel about our product. And you can kind of just, if, if they start to talk about things that are, you know, just for only their career development, and they don't talk about wanting to enrich lives and understand what we're doing and want to take over the world by helping people save money and, and, and that sort of thing, then, and, and if I try to dig those questions and I don't see that kind of caring aspect, then we won't hire them no matter how talented they are. So we're willing to you know, kind of drop people if we don't see a culture fit. Um, we talk about our company values, we watch how people respond to those values, and I think, even if you don't nail it, like you, you might have someone come in and maybe they weren't that way before, but we really embrace everybody that walks in the door. We have a really solid onboarding experience where we explain exactly what's expected of the staff that comes in. And, and you know, if you do tour the office, the, the values are written all over the wall. And so we make sure that we stick to those values. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. 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 Thanks for sharing the very inspiring story. My question is about marketing, actually. At what stage did you uh, have to include uh, external resources to help you out with marketing? And what was the, uh, the point? And then time and so, in stage. I'd say for the, first, for the first couple of years, the first year it was really just me popping up in places all over the internet. Um, I'd say in year, Three, we really upped our game in marketing, and then we realized as we were doing that that we needed to be in way more places. So that's exactly what we've done now. We've really expanded across the U.S. so that we can do some um, some some more um, like global marketing kind of thing. So that's that's what we're going to be doing next. Can I just jump in for another question? Sorry. Wondering, I, when you expanded to the U.S., what was the big difference that you saw there? I mean, at the end of the day, it's still a foreign country, right? Even though it feels similar, but I'm curious about what, what were some of the specific challenges with moving from Canada over to the US? So it, it's not even that we, you know what, we started off with communities all over the place, like overseas, Canada, US, everywhere. We just had to make a decision where to launch like, like the big bulk of our communities to start, because you want to win over a market, and then win over another market, and then another kind of thing. So we just chose the US to start. Cool. So we had a question over here. Yeah, we actually, st just, just to clarify that, most of, like how did we make that decision? Most of our garage sale communities seem to be really popular in the southern states, very like suburban areas. So we started like kind of clustering around there and then, and then we kind of expanded, so. Would you do anything differently now? No. no. no I think we made the right call there. Good, good call. Hey. Hello. Thank you. Hi, Tabby. Thank Hi. you so much for, uh, sharing your story with us. Um, speaking about your hiring process, there was a little bit of information online about some employee changes in the, since January that has happened at Variety Sale. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to speak about that or what happened to the changeover in the staff? Sure, yeah. So we did go through um, a round of layoffs in January. Um, given the, the climate in Silicon Valley and given that we're not, we, we don't have, rep, we're not, um, we don't have revenue right now, we do depend on investors' money. Given the climate in the valley, we were prudent and we decided to extend our runway as many companies um, out there did um, so that we could make sure 
<coughs> that we were that we were keeping it safe kind of thing. And I think it, it was definitely the right decision. We're we're still a very very strong team. We're just leaner. Hi, Danny. My Hi. name's Alex Todd. I'm a happy user of garage uh, sale. I have sold my furniture on. Fantastic. Great. Which community? Uh, it was in uh, North Toronto. North Toronto. And uh, I have a question for you. Um, when you talk about communities, I'd like to understand a little bit better what you mean by community development. How do you actually go about doing it? How do you manifest this community, sense of community? Are there people who uh, shop from each other on a regular basis? Is there, is there, is there kind of this? Uh, uh, concept of a brand or reputation from of, of, of various uh, participants in a particular community? How, how does that work? Sure. So a community on Garage Cell consists of members that ask to join, an admin that reviews the membership list and, and adds them in, and then it's buyers sometimes becoming sellers, sellers sometimes becoming buyers, and sometimes buyers are just buyers and sellers are just sellers. Um, some garage sale communities are full counties. Other garage sale communities are smaller areas, or neighborhoods, and that really depends on where you are on the map. So we learned like some really interesting things. Out in Texas, people will just drive and drive for an item, and then in some areas like, like downtown Toronto, for example, people don't have cars, aren't willing to go as far. So we've had to really learn um, if we're talking about like geographically, we've had to learn what works for which areas. So we, we do actually work with a mapper for that. Does that ha does that answer the question? I'm sure we're how you cultivate. How would you cultivate? Um. Sorry, my hair is getting You know, we watched the early communities that were on the platform that were run all by volunteers and we learned a lot from them, and then we hired a team to do a lot of that work, and we scaled it. Yeah. You're welcome. Hi, Tony. Where are you? There you are. Hi. Um, when you talk about the, uh, the problem you're solving, it sounds like the, uh, it's more about community than the products. Um, if, you, if you agree with that, I'm just wondering who you do see as like your competitors. Or if, or if it is just about products. I don't, I think our biggest competitor would be, you know, still social media buy and sell groups, for example, on Facebook. But I don't think that Facebook, or I know that Facebook will never be able to go as deep as we're gonna go. Because they have to focus on so many things. Facebook has so many different, um, you know, parts to it. So it's kind of like, you know, there, there are videos on Facebook, but then there's YouTube that owns online videos, right? So I feel like Garage Sale is the only company that's going to own the curated buy and sell experience. Hey, do we have any more questions? Oh, there's one. Hey, Alex. Hi, Tanya. Hi. Uh, I have a question about uh, related to travel tribulations. Like, did you ever arrive at the point when you have to say, this is stupid, it's not working out, and we're about to give up, and then something stopped you from totally giving up, or did you have to pivot at any point? It seems like your story is more or less straight line. Like, I wonder like, if there were any... Oh, it's never straight line. It never is. It, 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 it is way. always a roller coaster, ups and downs, um, nerve-wracking, always like celebrating. Um, I don't think I've ever gotten to the point where I want to give up, but I, there's just... The company, there's just such a need for the product, and I can't give up because <laughs> because Rash is my favorite app, and what would I do without it? Um, but really, I've had ups and downs like all other companies. Look, we talked about the layoffs in January. That was like, I think that was one of the worst days of my life. Like it was awful. We came out of it strong, but it was still a really you know down point for us. We can't help what happened with the climate, with with the economy, but it happens. Um, at first, when you're trying to raise money, it doesn't come like that. So there are times where you really wonder, am I gonna be able to raise this money? And then and then you do raise the money and you're celebrating, but a week before finding out, you're just you're down in the dumps because you're just not sure. Everything is up in the air. So we've definitely had our, our ups and downs. I think every startup has them. When you come up with a 
I was going to say an idea, a problem that yeah. makes for a good idea, and you really need an investment, um, I suggest to take the plunge because they're not against you at all. I work with some of the biggest investors in the world, same investors as Apple did, YouTube did, WhatsApp did, and I can tell you that those people are so in my corner, they are there for the best interest, not only of the company, but for us as people. They are real people. I have had the best experience with investors, like, like really. So I think you have to find the right investors. I think there's something to say there, because I'm sure you've heard some stories that are true, that haven't always all been positive. Um, but there are lots of great investors out there. If you are starting something small, you should start something small. You should start from yourself. It's when you really need that money that you need to find the right investor for you. But start off bootstrapping your company and make sure that you build a prototype and make sure that it works before you ask for money. Because we didn't take money until we knew that we were onto something. And our investors invested in us because they saw that we had a 50 Percent, fifty percent of our users came back daily. That was huge for them, and so they're not going to invest in you anyway unless you've got something that works. Thank you, Tammy. Round of applause. <laughs>